Thank you all for coming on this cold wintry day to Sunday Peace Program. So <clears throat> we'll be reciting a verse from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 40. Um, it's quite a well-known verse, it's a very nice verse. So we can recite uh, responsibly and then uh, we'll have some discussion. <clears throat> Niha bi kramana sosti, Niha bi kramana sosti, Tatyavayo na vidyate, Tatyavayo na vidyate, Swa alpam apiasya dharmasya, Swa alpam apiasya dharmasya, Trayate mahato bhaya, Trayate mahato bhaya, Niha bi kramana sosti, Niha bi kramana sosti, Tatyavayo na vidyate, Tatyavayo na vidyate, Swa alpam apiasya dharmasya, Swa alpam apiasya dharmasya, Trayate mahato bhaya, Trayate mahato bhaya, Niha bikramana sosti, Niha bikramana sosti, Tatyavayo na vidyate, Tatyavayo na vidyate, Pamapiasya dharmasya, Trayate mahato bhaya, Trayate mahato bhaya. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution, and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Let's uh, let's repeat this together. In this endeavor, in this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution. There is no loss or diminution. And a little advancement, a little advancement on, this path on this path can protect one, can protect from, one from the most dangerous type of fear. Okay, so we'll read the translation and uh, uh, sorry, we'll read the purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So. Activity in Krishna consciousness or acting for the benefit of Krishna without expectation of sense gratification is the highest transcendental quality of work. Even a small beginning of such activity finds no impediment, nor can that small beginning be lost at any stage. Any work begun on the material plane has to be completed, otherwise the whole attempt becomes a failure. But any work begun in Krishna consciousness has a permanent effect, even though not finished. The performer of such work is therefore not at a loss, even if his work in Krishna consciousness is incomplete. One percent done in Krishna consciousness bears permanent results, so that the next beginning is point from the point of two percent, whereas material activity without a hundred percent success, there is no profit. Ajamil performed his duty in some percentage of Krishna consciousness, but the result he enjoyed at the end was 100% by the grace of the Lord. There is a nice verse in this connection in Srimad Bhagavatam. Jaktva sad bharman charnam bhujam hare bhajan apkavot tha patet tato yadi yatrakva va bhadram ahud amushyakim if someone gives up his occupational duties and works in Krishna consciousness and then falls down on account of not completing his work, what loss is there on his part? And what can one gain if one performs his material activities perfectly or as the Christians say, what profiteth a man if he gain the whole world yet suffer the loss of his eternal soul? Material activities and their results end with the body. But work in Krishna consciousness carries a person again to Krishna consciousness even after the loss of the body. At least one is sure to have a chance in the next life of being born again as a human being, either in the family of great cultured Brahmana or in a rich aristocratic family that will give one a further chance for elevation. That is the unique quality of work in Krishna consciousness. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militamina Tasmai Shri Guru Namaha
So again, the verse Nihabi Kumana so sleep at Tivayana Vidyate, Swa Alpha Matiasya Dharma Shia, Prayate Mahato Bhaya. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution, and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. So let us <coughs> try to understand this verse a little bit. So the first <coughs> Part of the verse says, in this endeavor. So, what is Krishna referring to when he says, in this endeavor? What endeavor is he referring to? Trying to be Krishna conscious. Trying to be Krishna conscious, right? Okay. In what context? How does he how does he get to this point in Bhagavad Gita? It's chapter two towards the middle part. And what what brings him to this point? Anyone know? He's not talking, and when he says endeavor, he's not talking about uh, to Arjun in this endeavor, meaning in this endeavor of um, fighting and killing, right? Is that is that what he's referring to? Is something else? What is Krishna referring to when he says in this endeavor? Birth, birth after birth. Birth after birth, in the context of endeavor, in the context of endeavor. What? He's going to ask Arjun, or he's asking Arjun to do something, or work in a certain way, or perform or act in a certain way. Right? What is the clue? What is he referring? Perform activities. Perform activities, but how? For Krishna. For Krishna, right? Perform activities for Krishna, right? Okay. So the previous verse gives us a clue. Previous verse, two thirty nine, gives us a clue. He says, "Esheti vihita sankhe buddhi yoga tum imam shrinu." So Krishna is saying, so far I've explained to you all these other processes, specifically Samkhya Yoga and Karma Yoga and so forth. But now I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to give you Buddhi Yoga. He says, Buddhi Yoga Tau Imam Srinu. Right? In the translation, Prabhupada says, now listen, as I explain it in terms of working without fruitive activity. So until this point, he's explained analytically the difference between the body and the soul. He's also explained Sakam Karma Yoga. He says, even, even if you don't expect to win anything, you should fight anyway, because by fighting you will get a kingdom. Right? You will be, get, either you will die and uh, go to heaven, or you will be victorious and win over and rule the kingdom. Right? So in this sense, he was trying to convince Arjun to fight. But now Krishna is going to explain something different. He says, now listen as I explain. From a different angle, different perspective, buddhi yoga, buddhi yoga ta shrinu. So listen as I explain this more advanced process, higher process, right? He says when you act in such knowledge, you can free yourself from the bondage of works, right? He hasn't promised this so far. Until now, what he's done, he's going to get something in return, which, which also results in some obligation. But now he's going to provide a process by which he can be relieved from the bondage of work. So in this endeavor, we have two kinds of endeavors typically, right? We have material endeavors and we have spiritual endeavors. Okay, so what kind of motivation might we have for performing material endeavors? What kind of things might motivate us? Money, money, money. Enjoyment. Money, enjoyment. Sense gratification. Sense gratification. Right? Pleasure. Pleasure, right? Money. <coughs> okay. So happiness, right? My happiness, sense gratification, wealth. Also, I didn't hear, but you know, motivation for fame, prestige, recognition, right? So forth. These are things that motivate us materially. And um, uh, working in, in the material sense, you know, how would we characterize what it's like to work in the material sense? You know? Performing our material endeavors. How would we characterize that? Hard work, right? Hard work, right? Shram eva hi kevalam. Shram eva hi kevalam. It's hard, hard work, right? It can be very hard work, right? Uh, <clears throat> so, yes, sometimes laborious, hard work. It's very often reluctantly performed, right? We do it because we have to. 
Right? Nobody wants to get up in the morning and go to work, especially when it's wintry and cold like this, but we still do it. Right? Yeah. We still do it. It's hard work and so forth, but we go ahead and we do it. We love that we perform. And the other characteristics, which Prabhupada mentioned in the purport, in order for it to bear fruit, have result, we have to finish it. We have to complete it, right? We have to complete complete the job. Otherwise, we don't get paid. Kind of thing, right? <laughs> right. So we have to complete it. So that's the characteristics. And then what are the results we get from our material endeavors? You know, what after working so hard and you know doing so much, what are the results we get? Some happiness. Some happiness, right? Feel <laughs> <laughs> okay, key results, temporary. temporary. We get results, temporary. but the results are temporary. Right? They can be lost at any time. Right? They can be lost at any time. And if they're not lost at any time during our lives, they're certainly lost at the point of death. Right? Because no matter how hard we work and, and no matter what we uh, accumulate, or no matter how famous and uh, reputable we become, it's all gone at death, right? Death. And the other characteristics of the results is that these results bind us to the material world. Even if we perform pious activities, you know, looking after the poor, building hospitals and so forth, which are also material endeavors, they still bind us to this material world because uh, by that karma, we have to come back. So this is the characteristics of the spiritual world, right? Now, why would we perform, what's our motivation for performing spiritual endeavors? Eternal happiness. Eternal happiness? Bliss. 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 Is that the results or the motivation? What's the motivation? Uh, freedom from the suffering yes. situation. Freedom from suffering, okay. Contrast, contrast to the material side, right? Right? In contrast, on the material side, we're doing this for my happiness, our personal sense gratification. Right? In spiritual uh, endeavors, what defines it as being spiritual is it's not done for us. It's done for the Supreme Lord. Right? So Krishna's happiness, sometimes our motivation is the order of Guru, right? or to please the Guru. That's also a motivation. And sometimes it's to understand who we really are. Right? That's part of the motivation for any kind of spiritual endeavors to really understand you know, uh, fundamentally where we came from, who we are, where we're we going, and so forth, right? So these things that cannot be answered on the material platform. And now contrast the material elements, you know, what is it like, you know, what is the characteristics of spiritual endeavors? Joyfully performed, right? Yes, Krishna says, susukam kartum avyayam. Raja Vidya, Raja Guyam. And so sublime, easy, joyfully performed. And as Prabhupada pointed out in this verse, in the purport, we don't even have to complete those spiritual endeavors, right? We do our best, but if we somehow or other don't complete them, it's okay. The, the results aren't lost. And then the results, the results are permanent, eternal, never lost, right? Compared to temporary, can be lost at any time, right? <laughs> and um, instead of binding the spiritual endeavors, they liberate, they liberate us from the material condition. So there's a contrast between material endeavors and spiritual endeavors. So clearly, what Krishna is referring to when he says, in this endeavor, he's referring to this class of endeavors called spiritual endeavors. Because ultimately, these spiritual endeavors gives us the ultimate results, which is to take us back home, back to the spiritual world. Right. So this is the notion of endeavor and co contrasting the different endeavor. And just a, a nice little quote here. Krishna consciousness and these kinds of endeavors means, what does it really mean? Where we do some things for Krishna in such a way that we get more and more inspired to do more and more. Right? So this is the meaning, this is the nature of these types of endeavors, that they will inspire us to do more and more. Right? So. The saying is, how do we get bhakti? We get bhakti by performing bhakti. The more bhakti we do, the more we become inspired to do even more bhakti, right? which gives us more bhakti. So in this way, we, we can advance spiritually, gradually, sincerely. So in this endeavor, and the next part of the verse said, no loss or diminution. 
So what does that mean? No loss or diminution. Right? What happens? No. <coughs> so this is a, a nice little picture. So many billionaires, so many billionaires, but they, <coughs> they could lose their fortune overnight. Right? I don't know how many billionaires in India must have lost their fortune a month ago, right? When, <laughs> you can just imagine that. I, I heard so many stories of people have hoarding, you know, crores of rupees in warehouses and then dumping them in the river or burning them and so forth, right? Right. So all of that endeavor lost in a moment, right? Overnight by a decision, right? So this is this can happen to any of us. We think we think we're all secure and our bank balance and so forth is safe and you know, but at any time in the material realm, we can lose everything. Right? And if it's not taken away by the government or some uh, criminal activity or somehow we're cheated out of it, then we could die at any moment and lose everything. So this is the nature of material endeavors. Right? We can lose everything. <clears throat> and then the uh, last part of this verse, which is kind of what we wanted to focus on a little bit, is that even a little advancement on this path can protect us from the most dangerous type of fear, right? So, so now what is the most dangerous type of fear referred to? What is that? <laughs> yes, giving Sunday class, that's a dangerous type of fear. <laughs> sliding down to animal species. Sliding down to animal species. Right, right. But I mean, that's that's for us. We know some philosophy. We can say that, you know. But in general, right, uh, whether you take the population at large or even animal species, what what is the most fearful thing that they can happen? Right? Yeah. Death, right? Death. They're so afraid of losing this life at any moment. They can lose it, and they're always. It's so much anxiety to make sure that they're protected, just as we all are too, right? We do so much to protect our situation, you know, um, whether it's buying all kinds of insurance or taking cautious precautions and so many different ways we try to protect ourselves, protect our situation, right? So <clears throat> Krishna is saying that, you know, this, this process will um, relieve us of all that anxiety because it will give us this fear, right? So certainly the dangerous type of, most dangerous type of fear is the fear of death. Nice little comment here. If death and taxes are inevitable, inevitable, how come we never hear about the death of taxes? <laughs> <laughs> right? Taxes never die, right? <laughs> Otherwise, Jagdishwar Prabhu would be out of business. <laughs> He's got a secure future, right? <laughs> Uh, so fear of death. So and this whole concept of death is what gives us um, anxiety, fear, and insecurity. So uh, Rupa Goswami uh, also points this principle out. He says, you know, we have to become confident, we have to become certain, we have to become sure to overcome this fear. Right? He says, Utsaha nischaya dhariyat. Tat karma pravartana. Sangha jaga sato vritti sad bir bhakti prashidyati. Six principles for the favorable execution of pure devotional service, enthusi being enthusiastic. And the second one, this one I picked this verse, endeavoring with confidence, right? So in this endeavor, how do we perform our endeavor? With certainty and with confidence. Hmm? Being patient, acting according to regulative principles. Another important point, that that karma pravartanat means that it's not just understanding this knowledge and um, um, theoretically accepting it, but it actually means to do something physical, do something practical, do it. That that karma actually act on that knowledge. So acting according to those principles, in example given here, uh, shravanam, kirtanam, smaranam, vishnu smaranam, and so forth, right? And then abandoning association of non-devotees and following in the footsteps of previous acharya. So these uh, six principles assure the complete success of pure devotional service. And that's what um, Krishna is referring to when he says in this endeavor. He's referring to the endeavor of bhutti yoga, 
Buddhi yoga is also often translated as bhakti yoga or pure devotional service. And it's, it's interesting here because um, the majority of people that we're often surrounded with are insecure, they are in fear. They're in fear of their position, um, maybe their marriage, their bank balance, their, the tax, their fear of so many different things, right? Um, and it's a nice little comparison here of confident people and insecure people. And, and maybe you know, you'll recognize some characteristics in people you know, right? So <coughs> confident people, they're open-minded. Open-minded, they give compliments. They're willing to learn from other people. They take responsibility for thoughts, feelings, actions, and results. They operate on principles. They admit mistakes. They're not afraid to show flaws. They are positive thinkers, risk takers. They never talk negatively about others. Abundant mindset givers. Abundant mindset givers. Like spending time with people. Accept others' differences. Can laugh at themselves. Make decision quickly and keep learning and growing, right? So these are the characteristics of confident people. And when you contrast the insecure people, they're close-minded, they are always seeking some validation, they think they know it all, and <clears throat> they're always making excuses, they do what feels good to them, they tend to blame others for things going wrong, they sometimes appear flake, fake because they're trying to hide their real characteristics, they hide their flaws. They're often negative thinkers, um, inclined to stay in their comfort zone, um, <coughs> promote gossip. Um, they're scarcity thinkers, scarcity mindset, always thinking in a limited way. They sometimes dislike people, judgmental, worry what others will think, right? Uh, you know, a lot of us worry what others will think, right? But why is that? Because we have this insecurity. Uh, they have uh, difficulty making decisions and they want to stay in the old ways and they're not reluctant to change, right? So this is insecurity. So this is a contrast, right? Just the idea of <coughs> confidence and contrast in this context, right? Of endeavoring with confidence, endeavoring with confidence. So now how do we learn or how do we become confident in, in this context? How do we actually become secure, confident, fearless, right? Any thoughts? My association. Association with those that are confident, those that are, you know, advanced. Anything else? Having a strong faith in faith. Yes, very good. Faith in what? Faith, right? Faith, right? Yes, let's look at that. So real confidence and security, we cannot fake it. Right? If we, if we, and we sometimes perceive people or sense people are doing this. Inside they're shaky, right? Inside they're uh, insecure and uh, in anxiety. But on the outside they're trying to show a confident shell and so forth. But how can we develop that real confidence and security, right? It's a nice quote. Security is a byproduct of a right relationship with God. Right? So this is how we get real security, when we develop that relationship with God. Our scriptures also say the same thing. Chaitanya Charitamrita, Jivera Swarup Hoye, Krishnera Nitya Das. So what is our right position, relationship with God? What is our relationship with God? <coughs> we are... <clears throat> it, our constitutional position is to be the eternal servant of Krishna, God. Mm -hmm. So that's the relationship, right? Servant-master relationship. So when we uh, realize that servant-master relationship, then we can get security. We can get security, confidence, fearlessness, right? So this is the key to becoming fearless. Mm -hmm. Now, what would you say about this person? <laughs> Leap, of faith. Leap of faith, yes, literally. <laughs> Confident. He's having a parachute. <laughs> I was actually looking at the picture. It looks like if it's a he, he has a big kind of ponytail, or if it's a she, I don't know, but uh, he or she, but uh, anyway. It's questionable is this fearlessness or foolishness? You, know, you, you could debate that. You could de 
you could debate that, right? But it's possibly fearlessness. But okay, this is an, such a good example. What are some other examples of fearless people? Srila Prabhupada, yes, yes. What about other maybe devotees or other? Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj, yes. Prahlad Maharaj is one that comes to mind immediately, right? Right. <clears throat> Prahlad Maharaj, as we all know, he was persecuted, tortured, tormented in so many different ways, right? And <clears throat> still, he was always totally confident in the protection of the Lord. He had, he had no doubt, not even for a minute, no concern. And there, <clears throat> at, at one point, Hiranyakashipu asks him, he curses him and asks him, where do you obtain this power to defy my supremacy? What makes you so confident you know, in the protection? And Prahlad Maharaj, without any fear, you know, he answers, my source of my strength is Lord Vishnu, and he is the source of everyone's strength, including yours, right? Which even makes Hiranyakashipu even more mad, right? Uh, so um, <clears throat> this was the notion of Prahlad Maharaj. And again, why was he so fearless? Because he had total faith in Vishnu. And Krishna. He was totally surrendered to Krishna. So although the time factor is fearful to everyone, fear personified is afraid of the Supreme Lord, who is therefore known as Abhay, Abhay or fearless. And taking shelter of the Supreme Lord therefore brings us actual fearlessness. Right? Prabhupada's quote. Right? So fear is there all around us, but when we take shelter of the Supreme, Automatically, we get this product called Abhai, fearlessness. <clears throat> Another example of the Lord granting fearlessness. Right? Everyone recognizes this picture. Right? This is uh, Lord Ram. And who is that? No, Vibhishan. Vibhishan. Vibhishan is coming and he's surrendering to the Lord. And as we know in the story, um, uh, Hanuman and Amgad and so many people were so concerned. Vibhishan, Ravan's brother is coming. Should we attack? Should we fight? Should we kill him? And Ram said, no, let him come, let him come. And Vibhishan surrendered. <coughs> and Vibhishan surrendered. And then uh, Ram uh, spoke this very nice verse, very nice verse. He says, Shakrat eva prapanno yas. Shakrat eva prapanno yas. Right? Surrender. Prapanno means uh, surrender and chakra once. He says, <laughs> even if one surrenders only once, seriously, right? Tavasmati yachate abhyam sarvada tashmai dadami etat vittam mama. What does he do? Abhyam sarvada tashmai dadami. I give him abhyam fearlessness always. Right? So this is. Uh, this is Lord Ram's uh, promise, and he says, I vow, this is my vow, Ritam, I take this vrat, anyone who surrenders to me even once, I will award him fearlessness, right? It is my vow that if one, only once seriously surrenders unto me, saying, my dear Lord, from this day I am yours, and praise to me for courage, I shall immediately award uh, courage to that person, and he will always remain safe from that time on, right? So in the translation, Prabhupada uses the word courage, but abhyam, the Sanskrit, is actual fearlessness, right? Fearlessness is really what is being awarded there. So the lotus feet of our Lord are so wonderful that whoever takes shelter unto them immediately becomes purified, right? So this is, the <coughs> again, the secret of becoming fearlessness. Surrendering unto the Lord. We have a very nice uh, prayer. Govinda Das. Govinda Das prays. What does he pray? Bhaja Hure Mana Shri Nanda Nandana Abhaya Charanada Vindure Dulabha Mana Bhajana Masatsangi is praying, oh mind, oh man, man, bhaja hure mana, bhaj, worship, worship who? Shri Nanda Nandana, worship Shri Nanda Nandana, and how to worship Shri Nanda Nandana? 
worship his Charnaravinda, his lotus feet. We worship his Charnaravinda. And what will we get when we worship his lotus feet? A pie. Right? We will become fearless. Oh, mind, just worship the lotus feet of the son of Nanda, which make one fearless, having obtained this rare human birth, cross over this ocean of worldly existence through the association of saintly people. Right? So just as surrender unto the Lord. So was it a coincidence that Srila uh, Prabhupada was named Abhay Charan? Right? Abhay Charan. Already, you know, his parents named him that when he was born. Right? So he's already surrendered to the Lord's feet of the Lord. So certainly he was fearless, as we know, so many things he did in, in his life that made him totally uh, uh, <coughs> full of courage. No, no concern for anything, right? Yes. And he, not only was he himself that way, he imbibed that into his disciples, right? He said, you know, Dhamma Krishna, go to Japan, start the center line. I don't know anything about Japan, I don't know any people, I don't speak the language, but no, go, right? There were incidents, he's on traveling on the train, right, with his devotees, and they come to the station. He says, okay, you, you, and you, get off here and start center. <laughs> right? right? And he imbibed that courage in them to do it, right? Because he had it himself in him, so he could do that. So this was his mood. But it's, it's wonderful that his name imbibes that fearlessness. And the fearlessness comes because he's a totally surrendered soul. Right? This is his characteristic from birth. He's a totally surrendered soul, and he's got the appropriate name for it. <clears throat> so this uh, endeavor we were referring to at the beginning, we, we come to the idea that it means buddhi yoga. Buddhi yoga also means bhakti yoga. So <clears throat> a nice reference in Chaitanya Charita Amrita. What is this bhakti? Krishna bhakti abhidaya sarva shastra kaya ateva munigana kariyache nishchaya. This actually is the conclusion, not our conclusion or anyone's conclusion, conclusion of all Vedic scriptures. All Vedic scriptures and saintly people, they have concluded this. What have they concluded? That a human being's activities should be centered only on Krishna Bhakti, devotional service to Lord Krishna. And this, is, this is the conclusion. Working for Krishna is the ultimate perfection of all of our activities. But, but, yes, but, but what? There's always a but, right? There's always a but. You have to read the fine print in any contract. So, what else is there? What else is there? Why is there something more than performing Krishna Bhakti? Is it that easy that we can just all do it tomorrow, tonight, starting tonight? Is it that easy? What's the missing ingredient? So many difficulties. Uh, <laughs> earlier we said it's susukam kartum avyayam. So now don't bring up all these difficulties. Without selfishness. Hmm? Without selfishness. Without selfishness, yes. Uh, but I mean something different. I'm looking for. You know what? I mean, what do we really need? I mean, surrender. Yes. Ah, very nice. Very nice. The people who got it. Yes. Prabhupada says here, our own endeavors can take us so far, no matter how much we try, spiritually, materially. Our own endeavors can only take us to a certain level. Ultimately. To attain that supreme goal, we need the mercy. We need the mercy of the Vaishnavas, and we need the mercy of Krishna. Without their mercy, no matter how much we endeavor, we'll only get to a certain point. Right? Missing ingredient, right? Krishna Bhakti. So <clears throat> again, Prahlad Maharaj just um, in, uh, in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam underscores this point, that this human form of uh, Life is very rare, right? And he, he makes the same point Krishna makes in, in 240, 
that even that slightest amount of sincere devotional, it can not only give us fearlessness, but it can give us complete perfection, right? Even the slightest amount of devotional service, because it puts us on the right path. And we've heard many times this analogy that this human body, it's like the ideal boat, most valuable boat for crossing this ocean of material existence, material suffering. And in that boat, the spiritual master is the captain, and the favorable winds that are Vedic uh, hymns. And in this boat, with the help of the spiritual master and the Vedic uh, favorable breezes and so forth, we can actually cross over this realm of material world. So with that, I wanted to just close with my little advertisement here. Ram Prabhu um, mentioned it. So we do have this disciples course, which we teach every year, and has very nice topics on in our own hearts. If we look, it seems to sprout from some fear or another. And all of us have some sort of fear. Like some people have fear of heights, or fear of being you know, humiliated from other people, or fear of, you know, like phobia. There's so many phobias. Mm. All these phobias seem to be rooted in one very um, key ignorance. Mm. To think I'm the body. It seems to be like the root of so many of these phobias, because actually the soul is indestructible. I mean, if actually you will be indestructible, you will not be afraid of anything. This is a comment. Right, right, right. I mean, the same, right? Same uh, in that slide, right? Um, the security and fearlessness can only be obtained when we really understand our real identity, right? Our real identity, and then our, once we understand our identity, our identity relative to the Supreme Person, right? If we understand our identity, identity means relative to what, right? I mean, yes, we're spirit soul. What does that really mean? You know, what spirit soul? You know, what other kind of soul is there? If we're a spirit soul, is there other kinds of souls? You know, right? So we understand from Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures that yes, there is one other kind of soul, the supreme soul. Everybody else is spirit soul, but there's one supreme soul. So then, what is that relationship? Right? That relationship. Right? When we understand that, then we can perform and act on that. Basis, that relationship. Prahlad Maharaj is a great example because he, he got it from the very beginning mm. who Krishna is and he has a lot of faith. Right. He was fortunate enough to get that knowledge within the womb, right? right. Mm. In the womb and he brought it back to him. But that's also another key point in this verse, right? That somehow or other, um, if we perform some <laughs> devotional service, if we take one step in this life, then even if we fall and trip and you know aren't able to continue uh, <coughs> at some point either in this life or the next we'll be able to pick up where we left off and Prahlad Maharaj didn't get there just because you know he was that fortunate in Narad Muni came but he had obviously well, he's a Mahajan so but uh, you know he's has that and then we wonder you know all of the um, Disciples of Srila Prabhupada, no background, certainly apparently no background. They're born in this environment and no exposure to uh, principles of bhakti and the uh, environment um, <coughs> inducing them to actually uh, um, give up uh, religion, They're seeing all the religious wars and so forth. But somehow, because they had some sukriti, some uh, previous devotion, they came in connection with Prabhupada and they were able to continue to develop, right? So this is, this is the uh, notion of trying to perform some devotional service in, even in this, in this life. Right? Prabhu, if you could give some examples of how strong and fearless Sri Prabhupada's disciple were. For example, I remember one thing which I read recently in Nilambit that when Srila Prabhupada went back from America with some disciples and there were a bunch of disciples traveling with him on the train going to Jhansi. They had, uh, Banaras, they had a um, Pandal program that they were invited. And on the train, um, Mother Yamuna was there and she was given the uh, responsibility for making lunch for Srila Prabhupada. And with the limited means, she thought of what she would make. But the pantry car owner would not let her cook in the train pantry and 
she was so fearless that after arguing for a few minutes, she said that if you're not going to let me cook for my spiritual master here, I'm just going to go jump off the train. Oh, wow. And that made the pantry cart owner heart melt. Wow. And she did her service, finished it, and Prabhupada was very happy. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are many, many examples. I remember um, Malti Mataji telling me in Mayapur, right, the conditions there when they first went, it was just a shack, you know, not even a never mind the kitchen with a stove kind of outside, no water. She had to carry water from from the Ganga, walk to the Ganga, and then she, she had to she Prabhupada would send her to buy vegetables. She didn't know the language, you know, and she was fighting with the uh, uh, vegetable wallas and negotiating and bringing the vegetables, carrying the vegetables back and then uh, preparing, right? And uh, she was being, uh, and Prabhupada's god brothers were even there, right? And she kept on doing her service because she had, she had surrendered, right? All of those disciples, the, the source of their fearlessness, the source of their confidence was in Prabhupada. They surrendered completely to Prabhupada and they knew that no matter what happened, he would protect them. He looked after them. So, Yes. It doesn't have the same exact example when Mother Malti and Prabhupada always got brother the senior sannyasis and then when she, she she was sitting amongst all those his big godbrothers and dandas and everything and she came in very very humbly yeah. just looking down covering her her face with sari and just bringing his offering to him and then walking back and some of those sannyasis were probably like mocking and saying what's this it's so odd why is she doing right yeah. and Prabhupada looked at them and he told her told them that she will do anything for me she'll cut her throat for me. And then he said, I will do the same for her. Right. So much love here for his disciples. And that's what gave them fearlessness. They knew that Prabhupada would do everything to them also. And that is the, like the, it shows us it shows some glimpse into what it is to be spiritual. You know, this is spiritual life and how it is that the spiritual master gives us his everything and we give we are supposed to give everything to the spiritual master, our poor selves. So yes. Prabhupada kind of highlighted that fearlessness. Yes. <coughs> it's very nice. It's that surrender, right? In that verse with Sri Ram, you know, it's, it seems sometimes cheap. Okay, you know, just surrender once and we're done. Right? We surrender once. And someone could say, I came to the temple once, I'm done, I'm surrendered now. <laughs> you know, I'm, Krishna, I surrender to you. Okay. Right? But, you know, the words are chosen with complete surrender, right? Complete, unconditional, unmotivated surrender. That's when we get the result. Jai Shishi Gornikai. Okay. And Kuldi Prabhu? So, uh, Prabhuji, one of the main reasons for the fear is breaking of rules. When uh, people break rules, they have natural fear that I broke a rule. Like you just said, like fear of tax or anything. So, Prabhupada also made rules. Uh, mm -hmm. Chant, eat vegetarian, and uh, do yeah. certain things, live by four people. Who is to say now that now I have got initiated and I don't follow these rules. Mm. So where is that? If I have the fear in me, now I'm every day scared, I break the rules, I go in front of God, I'm still scared, I'm still breaking the rules. Because I have all the reasons in the world to say I could not do chanting, I could not do certain things. You know what? Sorry, God, I, I, I'm going to do it tomorrow for sure, 16 rounds. Pray, right. please forgive me. But, so that's, that's the question then, you know, is that... I, have you surrendered? Have you surrendered? If, if surrender means that once you've surrendered, the person you've surrendered to, you're their servant. You do what they want, right? You have to do exactly what they tell you. You surrender your free will. But then you have got a fear now. Hmm? Because now you're thinking that, oh, you know what? I have no leeways. I have to follow this line now. I, I, I just can't. Actually, it's the other way around. Now, now you're surrendered. If you aren't going to follow the uh, guidelines or the instructions of your supreme authority, your, your spiritual master, or, or instructions from the scriptures, and then then you do have uh, do do have to fear. Yes, but if you are going to follow, which is the meaning of surrender. Then you have nothing to fear. But then that's what many people say. Many religious people get caught in a dogma 
which is like doing certain things versus getting the larger purpose in life that is what is their actual goal they get caught in the dogma basically that i have to do certain number of worshiping in the uh, in the day and i cannot do my work now otherwise something bad will happen to me it depends on your definition of something bad but <clears throat> okay uh, <clears throat> if if they are uncertain about that surrender i mean those those people are um fickle in that sense they they've sort of surrendered but they haven't right it's it's like trying to um, um <clears throat> progress materially and spiritually at the same time right this this is what we all want to do right it's all we all want to do this in reality though the more we progress spiritually our material progress has to kind of shrink as the balance works the other way around you can't push them all together right you can try and progress materially and spiritually in that same way you have to make sacrifices when you surrender you have to make sacrifices you know and and many people aren't willing to we want to surrender but you know uh, we still want to go out to the movies and we still want to you know uh, eat this and that this time and and so forth we're not willing to really so that's not real surrender that's not real surrender right? real surrender is unconditional unmotivated yes so just a comment on that is this idea so proper call is regular principles of freedom yes sometimes you think if it's regular how can be freedom but the analogy i like which someone gave is very nice it's like you know the divers the divers who study sharks they go in the ocean to study sharks but the diver goes inside a cage mm. the cage is there to protect the diver from the sharks mm. the diver is in the ocean he study sharks taking pictures and the shark comes and hits the cage but the diver is fearless Diver is only fearless because it's protected by the cage. The diver is not wondering, "Oh my God, let me see if I step out of the cage." Then, oh, this whole cage thing is so bad. Now, having not having is ridiculous. The cage is what protects the diver. So, similarly, these regulated principles, these rules and regulations, that's to protect us. The rules and regulations of keeping ourselves clean so we don't get infected, don't get sick. People, people who are following principles of hygiene are not afraid. And they're not freaking out either. Say, oh my God, if I don't do this, they just live normal life. They brush their teeth. It's a normal life. So similarly, following four regular principles, chanting Hare Krishna, this is normal life for the soul. It is not that oh my God, I have to do all these rules and more fear. Oh my God, if I don't do it, no, this is normal life. People are not afraid. Oh my God, tomorrow I don't brush my teeth. What will happen? It's normal life. Is it? So it's kind of like that. These are regular principles that protect us. They don't give us fear. They actually give us fear less. What, what did Prabhupada say? You know, these four regular principles doesn't make you a devotee. It's just bringing you to the point of being human, right? You, you, this is basic human versus animal behavior, right? It's just bringing you to the point of being human. Now you're at the point where you can cultivate devotion, bhakti. It's not dogma, right? Okay. Um, can you elaborate on Vaishnava mercy and from an angle of somebody who walks into temple for the first time? What is this Vaishnava mercy and how do we recognize from the material perspective? Yes, so she, uh, <coughs> she's asking um, what is this Vaishnava mercy all about and especially for someone coming to the temple for the first time, how, how do they recognize it? You know, what, how do they benefit it? So, <clears throat> Vaishnava mercy can manifest in many, many ways. You know, so, uh, in your example, if someone was coming to the temple for the first time, they meet a devotee, they talk to the devotee, the devotee gives them a book, right? Maybe they exchange phone numbers, he calls them, you know, asks them, and now if they act on that, they take interest on that, right? So, he's a benefactor of that little bit of mercy, right? Certainly no devotee had to talk to them. Right? You, could, and, you know, you could have come to the temple, taken darshan, maybe taken some prashad and gone, right? Prashad, of course, is another form of mercy. Right? Prashad means mercy. So that's another form of mercy, different kind of mercy. Uh, <coughs> Vaishnava mercy also, um, <coughs> the classic story or example that illustrates Vaishnava mercy is the story of Mrigari the hunter, right? Mugari the hunter. Mugari was such an evil-minded 
demoniac mentality person, not only killing animals, but killing them in such a way that they wouldn't die, they would suffer, right? And you derive pleasure from watching them die in anguish and pain and so forth. But somehow or other, he ran into Narad Muni. And Narad Muni said, okay, you know, maybe this killing is in your blood, but if you're gonna kill them, kill them totally at least. Don't kill them halfway and make them suffer much more, right? And somehow or other, you know, that instruction stuck with him, he gave up killing and purified his existence. Next time Narad Muni came, he was jumping all over the place because he didn't want to step on any ants, right? Never mind killing the animals. So that's Vaishnava mercy, right? <clears throat> Vaishnava mercy, you get by association of devotees. When we associate with devotees, you know, <clears throat> especially devotees who are more senior than us, then if we try to serve them, Krishna says, that vidi prani patena pari prashnena sevaya upadekshanti te gnana rani nasta to dashya. Yeah. Just try to approach the spiritual master and render service unto him. How we get this Vaishnava mercy is by trying to render service to the Vaishnavas, devotees, and so forth. You know? And we, we joke about the plate washing you know, uh, thing, and sometimes we consider that to be mundane. But on the spiritual platform, just think about it. when we're washing the plates of other devotees, Vaishnavas, in this temple, that is a source of mercy. There's spiritual benefit to it. So, lots of different angles to look at. Okay, thank you all so much for.